Now you're you're a big fan of NMN, and before I read your book, I had never even heard of NMN. Why why is that good? Well, now we're talking about research uh, from my lab in the early two thousands. We found that the sirtuin longevity genes that we've my team and well, I should say my my mentor's team, Lenny Garanti, uh, discovered sirtuin. So let me tell you about sirtuins. These are seven genes in our body. Some of us have better versions than others. And in general, it's it's found that they protect the body against diseases raging, raging from um, Alzheimer's to diabetes. Now, these genes are get switched off over time. Their, their main role is to make enzymes that tell the body how to survive during adversity. So when you're exercising and dieting and in sauna, they come on, protect the body. But the problem is, as we get older, they become less active. And one of the biggest problems is that for their activity, they require a a little molecule in the body, a very abundant one called NAD. NAD is required for life. It's involved in chemical reactions, but it's also used as a sensor of, for the body of adversity. When we have no adversity, we're eating a lot and sitting around, NAD levels go down. That's true as we get older as well. So a 50 year old has half the levels of a 20 year old for NAD. Um, and uh, what we like to do is to boost the levels of NAD back up to youthful levels and mimic exercise, mimic dieting, or even enhance those modalities. Now we've even got um, human clinical trial data. I was mentioning one of my companies has done clinical trials already for the last few years. And by raising NAD levels, we can actually improve human health. And we hope that this will be a drug one day to treat diseases ranging from kidney failure to even COVID-19 survival. So what about NMN? Well, NMN is a precursor that the body uses to make NAD. And by ingesting NMN, we've shown in humans that you can raise your NAD levels by about two to three fold. Um, and that's beneficial uh, in humans based on clinical studies. Um, you know, when I say I'm a fan, you know, I'm, I'm not selling this stuff. A lot of companies claim that I'm involved with uh, selling it. That's not true. Uh, I spend a fair amount of legal fees on trying to stop that. Um, but yeah, any, any NAD boosters, as they're called, seem to be really beneficial. I take NMN um, and I've been doing so for probably about eight to 10 years. And uh, so far, so good. I've only seen benefits. Some people ask about. And so, so basically you're saying the goal is to increase your NAD. Um, one way to do that is through exercise. You can do that by fasting, sauna. Um, but there, this other way to do it is to is to take this NMN um essentially it's a supplement and you and th and that can also boost your nad uh yes that's what the science is saying and others have shown it improves six minute walk so it's being used for performance uh endurance uh, and overall health it's not proven that it extends lifespan in fact we've only just recently found it extends a mouse's lifespan and haven't published that yet so it's early days we still have a lot to, to go on um or to do at least but, are there um, side yeah, effects for taking it or there um or does doing one thing make it harder to do something else or it doesn't seem to be i mean mice in mice there's a couple of studies in some rare cases of genetically inbred mice uh that don't have an immune system uh that they there's hints that cancer might spread slightly more frequently in a very small study but these are mice that are inbred and have no immune system so it's still full steam ahead with human clinical trials. There's been no adverse events in any of the patients that have been tested um, or the subjects, I should call them. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm not yet ready to say that there's any known uh, or at least uh, tangible, provable risks that, uh, you know, I want to be the first person to know if there's a risk because yeah. my father takes it, my friends and family take it, I take it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not selling it. I just want to know the science. But I do know that my father is too old to wait till 100% proof that this extends lifespan. You and I are getting to that point where we can't wait. Um, and so that's really what I'm doing is I'm educating the public about the risks and rewards. There are a couple of um, mouse studies that I want to point out. But, you know, all weighed up, I think that uh, the risk right now for me and my family is it's worth taking that risk until until further notice. Now, you also take metformin. Um... And, um, and, um, like, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but was virtual. Sorry. Oh, it was virtual. It was virtual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, and often I'll, 
you know, when I talked to my doctor, he's like, well, I, I feel like, you know, maybe you're a bit too young to take metformin. And maybe, you know, I, I often encourage my patients who are, let's say, 60 or over, but it has some side effects and that it makes it a little bit less likely to build muscle mass and stuff like that. Like, how do you weigh some of those things? Uh, well, let's start with when should you start? Um, I had a, a real um, heart to heart with my doctor when I was 29. I had super high cholesterol levels. And he said, I don't want to put you on a medicine because you're too young. And I said, dude, it, I don't want to wait till I get heart disease to go on a medicine, get put it on me, put it on, uh, put me on it now. So I've, I've always been of the philosophy that it doesn't matter what age somebody is. You treat everybody the same way, you know, within reason, of course, 20 year olds are a bit young for this kind of stuff. But if you're in your thirties and you want to uh, prevent heart disease, prevent uh, diabetes, I think that it's perfectly fine uh, under doctor's supervision taking medicines that will prevent disease, especially when does these medicines are extremely safe. You do it under doctor's supervision in case there's a problem. But with metformin, for example, and certainly resveratrol, very, very, very rare that somebody uh, gets so sick that it's a problem. And it's, it's always reversible as well. You just stop taking it if you get sick. So these are risks I think were, are worth taking. I don't prescribe anything. I don't even recommend anything publicly. So I would say, talk to your doctor. You know, it's, if they say you're too young, I would keep fighting it. I would show them <laughs> yeah. the data. And if, if you want, there's always alternative doctors. Um, I just, I think that the, the argument that when you're young, it's too early. I, you know, I, well, I would, there's a, there's the a, doctor, a, at least, at least what I heard that there's this trade off of like, okay, it's hard to build muscle mass. Building muscle mass is very important as you get older. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, so you have to figure the trade. Well, it's frustrating to me as a scientist that when somebody says something in public or someone, a podcaster says it's a problem, it becomes locked into the public's consciousness. And unfortunately, nobody ever goes back and reads the actual paper that this came from. And that, that was also true for the women's health initiative and breast cancer people still believe that HRT causes breast cancer and uh, that turns out it doesn't. Same for metformin and ex exercise. When you look at the data, uh, and it's really easy to see, it's not difficult, you can look at it. The graph that says there's a difference, uh, first of all, is being manipulated in a way that is deceiving. They cut off the y-axis so that you're just seeing the very tippy top of the bars. And the actual difference is about 5%. Um, and it turns out that that 5% is almost certainly due to people just not doing the extra couple of reps in the exercise because they feel a bit more tired. So what's the solution? Well, if you don't mind having muscles that are 5% smaller, then no big deal. Those muscles are yeah. just as strong and healthier um, and have less inflammation. I don't care if my muscles are still 95% there. I'm not trying to win any contests for bodybuilding, but I can also, <laughs> I can, avoid metformin on days I work out, no big deal, or force myself to do a couple more reps when I feel tired. That's all it is. I wouldn't say that that's a reason not to take metformin. There are other reasons such as gastric, uh, in gastrointestinal issues. That's more of a, an issue. But I think it, the point here that I want to make is make sure that the science is true and the data that you're getting is true. Don't just believe pundits or even, uh, you know, doctors who are saying this stuff, try to go to the paper, read it, or listen to scientists who do read papers and also just measure yourself do it under doctor supervision make sure that it's not harming you make sure you feel fine and then by all means in my view it's worth starting in your 40s to maximize your lifespan because we're aging every day it doesn't just begin after the age of 50 or 60. now initially i, I was actually kind of skeptical to the idea that like big subsets of the population would adopt any of these anti-aging lifestyles. But then I saw a couple of studies that say 10% of Americans are already intermittent fasting every single day. Over 25% have already tried it. Maybe intermittent fasting is 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 not the best one to measure because it's it's kind of easy to do. You just kind of skip breakfast. And so it's kind of a simple, a relatively simple thing to do. But how optimistic that you actually will see widespread behavior changes? Well, we are in, in the midst of a revolution in um, people's wellness and how active they are in their own health. Uh, the pandemic was a major wake up call to people who stared in the mirror and saw their own mortality 
And then there was a boom in home testing because people didn't want to go into doctor's offices for obvious reasons. And so it's becoming also easier for people to take home tests. Now, we don't want people you know, going rogue and testing themselves and trying to interpret themselves with chat GPT-4 and beyond. I don't think that's the only solution. I think there's a risk that uh, we won't have enough doctor supervision and that some people will overdo it. Yeah. There's always that risk. So there's a caution here. I do think though that there's a place for people taking their own health into their own hands. You can't always be supervised by your doctor when you're at a restaurant. People do need to realize that most of what affects their health in the future is up to them, not their doctor. And what you do every day in your life echoes for decades. And that changing your lifestyle is as important, if not more important than the medicines you will take. And that's why I think that this revolution that we're seeing in the population, not just in the US, but around the world um, is a great thing and will only become more prevalent. And in 20 years, it'll be the majority of people will will be on board with uh, monitoring own health. It's going to get easier and easier with devices as well, uh, cheaper and cheaper. And we'll look back at two years ago when almost nobody did this and think that going to your doctor once a year for an annual checkup and having the doctor bang on your knees and cough uh, will will seem medieval. In fact, even to us today, it seems medieval. Yeah, it's in, in the intermittent fasting one. It's while it's you know maybe. Uh... 10% of the population, it seems like it's, it's probably closer to 40% of my friends. Oh yeah. And, um, and one, I think one of the reasons is, well, besides the fact that it's, it's relatively easy to do, um, it's, it's maybe one of the easiest ones to, 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 to do of, of all the, of all the things that people prescribe. Um, it's also, also pretty easy to, to, sh to, at least for people to believe that has low harm. Um, and cause, cause if you say to somebody, stop eating meat or something like that. First of all, I think that's hard for people to do because they, 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 they might love their meat. And second, they may, they may show you 40 studies of how that actually could do harm to them. Um, whereas, and so, I, so it's, it's, it's kind of like there's both uh, things that come in of why people may change behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and everybody's different. Some people like hot and cold therapy. Some people don't. Um, yep. Exercise is for some, it's not for me although I know it's important to do. Um, and the same goes for fasting. I, I do agree that there's a real, uh, I don't know if it's fashion or a permanent trend for people to not eat the three meals a day that we were told to eat and snack in between. I think that's very 2010. We're beyond that now. Um, most people realize that we're eating too much. Obviously, you can see it in people's waistlines. Um, and I think that 10% that is an underestimate that certainly in people who are taking notice of what's out the information that's out there. Um, yeah. In, in my circles, of course, it's, it's 95%, but I think I, I meet enough people from the general public that it's way more than 10% that people are interested in their health. And I think that's also largely driven by the pandemic. People worried about getting sick and dying. I mean, what 30 or 40 year old ever had to worry about that before. Yeah. And so after that, in the, in the aftermath, people are just more interested in seeing what they can do now. And fasting is a pretty easy way to go to start skipping breakfast. A lot of people do that anyway. Trying to have a very small lunch or skip lunch is another way to go. I like to eat within a six hour window at night, uh, have dinner. I'm, I often, uh, as I said, snack a little bit during the day, but that's my goal at least. And I compensate by drinking a lot of liquids that don't have sugar in them. Uh, and that helps. Yeah, you know, it's it's an amazing thing to see how just in in my career, working on aging and talking about aging and talking about longevity and fasting went from total fringe in science to now mainstream in uh, not just science, but in the general public.